Hello, um, I'm going to give you just a very quick crash course on tumours in the GI tract. So um, let's start by looking at the normal GI wall first. And um, here we're looking at a snapshot. Here is the mucosa. This is uh, lined by epithelium, squamous if it's in the esophagus, and glandular if it's in the stomach, small and large bowel, and again squamous in the anal canal. And this, of course, uh, faces the lumen. Just below the mucosa is the submucosa, and this is usually composed of loose connective tissue with some blood vessels. And then we have this pink uh, layer here, which is made up of smooth muscle, called the muscularis propria. Within this, there will also be the nerve bundles and ganglion cells that drive peristalsis. And uh, finally, just below that is the subserosa, and this is usually composed of adipose tissue. So the serosal surface, uh, if the part of the gut is uh, not retroperitoneal, there'll be a lining serosal surface, which is covered by mesothelial cells. And uh, in order to understand the tumours, we must, uh, of course, know that there are two big categories. There are benign tumours, which can sometimes be pre-malignant, uh, pre and of course, there are malignant tumours. And it's best to approach them by looking at the layers. So... Starting with the mucosa, uh, depending on where we are looking at, if it's the esophagus, this is lined, um, as I told you, by benign squamous epithelium. So benign neoplasms would include squamous papillomas. And sometimes you don't actually see a polyp or a mass, but it's just a flat area of abnormal mucosa. And this is called dysplasia or intraepithelial neoplasia. Dysplasia can also be sometimes seen in papillomas and uh, there are different grades of dysplasia. There is low grade and there is high grade. Once it is high grade, we are very worried that it may progress on to an invasive carcinoma, which is known as squamous cell carcinoma. So for high grade dysplasia, often uh, that whole area needs to be uh, excised and this will cure the patient and prevent the development into carcinoma. Now, uh, going down more distally, uh, we also have benign neoplasms. Benign neoplasms or polyps are seen most commonly in the colon, and these are called adenomatous polyps. There are other types of polyps, some of them are hyperplastic or inflammatory, but an adenomatous polyp is actually neoplastic, and um, it can be called a tubular adenoma or a villus adenoma, depending on the architecture under the microscope, or sometimes a mixed pattern, and we'll call them tubular villus adenomas. And again, adenomas can have low or high-grade dysplasia in the adenoma. At the same time, you can also have dysplasia in the areas of flat mucosa without necessarily forming a polyp. And as the same as an esophagus, it is the high-grade dysplasia that we are worried about in terms of progression to an invasive glandular tumor, which is called adenocarcinoma. Now, um, this is the molecular model for the evolution of colorectal cancers. It's very well studied and it's called the adenoma carcinoma sequence. We start off with normal colon. There are some mutations or aberrations uh, in the genes. And along the way, there are cumulatively increasing numbers of aberrations, which leads to the development of these um, adenomatous polyps or tumors, which are benign. And further on, as they collect even more abnormalities, such as p53 uh, mutation, they can develop into invasive adenoCA. Now, moving on, the next layer is the submucosa. And there are really not so many tumors that can arise here. A benign tumor example would be a lipoma, which is a benign tumor that is made up of fatty tissue. And it will be seen like a little protruding bump um, if the clinician looks at it. Uh, in through the endoscope. Now, um, there are also neuroendocrine tumors. These are epithelial in origin. They actually originate from the deeper part in the mucosa, but uh, because they're quite deep, often when they form tumors, they extend into the submucosa or push into the submucosa, and therefore they tend to look as if they're arising in the submucosa. Now, neuroendocrine tumors are actually all considered to be potentially malignant because they can metastasize um, especially to lymph nodes, and they can even metastasize to the liver. This is an example of the microscopic view of a neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, you may be familiar with the term carcinoid. We also use this term for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. And it's got a very interesting uh, nested kind of pattern where you see well-defined nests of tumor cells. 
if we look at higher power, um, there is also a very characteristic feature. Looking at the nuclei, you can see that there are fine uh, dot-like dot chromatin areas and also coarser um, areas, and this is known as salt and pepper chromatin. This salt and pepper chromatin, or this stippled appearance, is very, very classical for neuroendocrine tumours. Moving into the deeper zone now, um, in the muscularis propria, again the esophagus is a little bit different from the rest of the gut. The most common tumour that arises in the muscular layer is actually the benign smooth muscle tumour, which is known as the leiomyoma. Very rarely we can have malignant ones, leiomyosarcoma. And uh, interestingly, in the rest of the gut, the most common stromal tumour that arises uh, within the muscularis layer, or sometimes in the submucosa, is the gastrointestinal stromal tumour. And this is also known as GIST, G-I-S-T. Um, and we kind of decide how bad a GIST is based on where it is. If it's in the stomach, it's actually got a better prognosis. We also look at the size of the tumour and we look at the mitotic counts. And based on these three features, we decide on whether it is low risk or high risk. And when I say risk, I mean a risk of aggressive behavior or progression, such as recurrence or metastases. This is an example of what a gist would look like grossly. And uh, you can see that it's clearly not arising from the mucosa. Rather, it is arising in the wall of the gut. It is pushing up against the mucosa. Um, and on the microscope, you will see these long bundles of very spindle cells. This is, in contrast, an example of a different type of stromal tumour. This is the esophagus that we're looking at with the mucosal surface here. This is the wall of the esophagus. And if I magnify this, we can see that there's clearly a tumour that's arising in this brown, thick, muscularis propria layer. It's very well circumscribed and very rounded. And this is the classical gross appearance of a leiomyoma. Right, so now let's quickly have a look at how do we prognosticate tumours, and I've mentioned this also in the Neoplasia chapter. Take a look at a gastric adenocarcinoma. Um, what we want to know is how bad is the tumour, meaning how likely is it going to cause uh, very severe clinical consequences for the patient. So we do grading and we also do staging, and this uh, grading is always done under the microscope. What we do is look at the tumour, and we can see here, for example, in this uh, tumor on the left side, there's very, very clear gland formations, but these are not normal glands, they're extremely irregular, and um, if I were to show you a high power picture, you would see all the cytologic features of malignancy, which you can revise by having a quick look at the Neoplasia chapter. There is a mind map uh, with some drawings. So this is a well-differentiated tumor because it is forming nice uh, glandular structures. This, on the other hand, is a tumor that does not form any glands at all, but instead we see single cells. They have this appearance where the nucleus is pushed to the side, and the reason is because the cell is full of mucin. So glandular cells, they either can form glands and produce mucin, or if they are not able to form glands because they are so poorly differentiated, they should still be able to produce some mucin. These cells are called signet ring cells. This is an actual example of a signet ring, just to show you how similar it looks. And Clearly, this is a well-differentiated adenocea with nice, well-formed glands. This, on the other hand, is a poorly differentiated adenocea without any gland formation, but still um, capable of producing mucin. Now, in the Loren classification, this would be diffuse type gastric adenocea or signet ring cell type adenocea, and this would be intestinal type. Staging is also extremely important uh, in terms of tumour prognostication. The higher the stage, the worse the prognosis. So the T and M system is used, T standing for tumour, and we can see that depending on how far down the tumour cells dip uh, through the wall of the gut, whether it's the stomach or whether it's the colon, the number of the T stage increases. Right? So this is how we do grading and staging of gastric as well as GI uh, adenocarcinomas.